Welcome everybody to today's online webinar uh, showing you all about how you can manage your Vernon Browser website. Uh, Vernon Browser has three key components which we'll be looking at today. There's tools in Vernon CMS to help you select what records, which fields from those records and which images end up in your online collection site. There's then the hosted Vernon Browser software which stores that content and it also analyzes images, adding extra data, and provides you the tools to manage that content. Lastly, we provide pre-built templates to present that information to the public, and we do branding uh, for each individual client to customize the look of those sites. So I'll start off first by just giving you a quick example of a completed site and then we'll work back from Vernon CMS showing how we maintain the content originally and how it flows through the system. The site I'll look at first is a recent addition to our Vernon browser family. It's the New Zealand Maritime Museum. And so we can see here the typical templates of Vernon browser and they've been customized then to include a hero image for this particular client as well as a number of different ways to explore the data that they've chosen to publish to the public. The public can choose to see one of their featured collections. These are pre-saved searches that are just looking for all of the records that match a certain category. Often that's based on things like the department field, the classification, or the object type of individual records. And so we can see here seven different broad categories of objects within the Maritimes collection, as well as an overarching category to see all of the records. There's also the option of creating curated highlight sets. So in this case, the staff are hand picking items that they want to group together and then uploading an image and a title to go with that. And they can be changed at any point and so they can be temporary tying in with current events. There's a simple search box which searches across all of the content that's available online. And then there's also tags which are based on terms that are in authority fields back in the collection records. So the most popular makers that are represented within your collection, for example. We also produce something we call the bird's eye view uh, or the mosaic view where you can see all of the public images on one single screen. Uh, and at the end of today's talk, I'll just show you how that's been used by another client. Lastly, the browser software, when it receives the information from Vernon CMS, can analyze the images to identify additional information. So for example, it can identify the colors that are represented in those images and provide that as another way of browsing the content. So that's a quick example of the home page of a completed site. I'll switch back now into Vernon CMS and we'll look at those uh, foundation tools for choosing what content goes online. So I've got open a record of a natural history specimen. You may have decided that this particular record is ready to go online. There's a dedicated field for marking that, and that's part of the administration page. So in the published collection field, you can mark a particular record as being ready to publish just by uh, adding a term in that field. Many of our sites would just have one single category, something like online collection, but it is possible to create several broad collections and then within Vernon Browser, things like the advanced search page can be specific to those individual collections. So an example would be library, archives, natural science, uh, and decorative arts might all have quite different fields and labels and search options. So if you created separate public published collections for those broad groups, Within Vernon Browser, you can then have some finer control about how those individual types of records are presented. In our demo system, we've just got two broad collections of human history and natural history. 
those individual records may also have one or more images. So you can also control which images from each record go online. So this particular record has an image of the specimen itself, and then it has a secondary image of the label that was attached to that specimen. I may decide that that label isn't relevant to the public or that perhaps the image isn't high enough quality. So I can choose not to publish specific images if I wish. That's done through the photo audio visual settings. So these are the two images that are available for that record. I'll go to the related photo records and we can see a publication status field on each of those individual images. In the publishing step, you can decide whether you only want to uh, publish the primary image, or if you're publishing all of them, then you can disable specific ones by marking them as no public access. And so that's what I've done on the label image. I've changed the publication status to no public access. You will have noticed that the first image had no status you can also decide what happens to the images with no publication status. You might take a conservative approach and say they won't end up online and only images that you've specifically flagged as full public access go online. Or alternatively, as in this example, we can decide that if the record goes online, then only remove the ones where it says something like no public access and allow them, the ones that are blank, to still go online. Now, as part of the publishing step, you can also control what fields are presented to the public. That's done through a saved report, and so it can include any combination of fields that are part of the website. So that'll be typical descriptive fields, like the title, the accession number, the maker, the production place but it can also include custom fields. In this example, I've created a user-defined field. So that's a field that isn't there in the system by default, but the system supervisor has enabled, so that I've got a description which is just for public access and is distinct from the brief description that's part of the catalog record. I can also use calculated or symbolic fields to alter the presentation of the object data during that publication step. So a couple of examples might be that the department has several different levels within it. You may want those to each appear as separately clickable links or buttons on the website. So we can create a calculated field that does that splitting back in Vernon and makes it so that zoology in this case would be a separately clickable term. Another example would be classification, where on this record we've got a species name and a genus. You might want to split those up so that you can show genus with its own label on the website as a distinct field. So that's something that we work together with each client to sort out, to decide whether there's any of that kind of reformatting of the data that's going to happen during the publishing step. Once we've sorted out all of those fields, we create a saved report that selects them. And so that's just using the standard reporting screen in Vernon. And we're doing things like just selecting which fields are going to go online. So we can see on the right hand side, the fields that are available uh, for our demo system within our online collection. Many of those fields are true cataloging fields, but some of them are those calculated fields that are splitting out or reformatting data in certain ways. So the family field is a calculated one, which is getting the information from the classification term. When we run that report, it puts the data in a temporary folder on our computer, and we then need to copy that information across to the website. So the images have to be copied, and then we have to import the text data. We use FileZilla to transfer the images, so that gives you a folder view of your own computer 
and the destination server. And it's just a case of dragging and dropping the images folder from one side to the other. There's also the option of doing live updates and that's increasingly the way that our clients are working. So rather than doing a manual export through the reporting tool and copying those uh, images and importing the data, you can set up Vernon to automatically detect whenever a record is changed. And if it's marked as being published, then to send the record and its associated images in the background to your website. If I switch now across to the website, we can see some of those admin tools then for maintaining that information that's been published. So this is the demo version with the same collection data. If I searched for BFly, the specimen that we were looking at will be one of the records that's available. However, I can configure many different things about that presentation in the admin screen of Vernon Browser. And so that's accessed just from whatever your website name is and then forward slash admin, and you'll have a login to get into the section. And then we can maintain various aspects of that information. So firstly, that's where we can do those manual imports. If your site is manually um, choosing when you want to export and import data. And that's just a case of choosing the most recent file from your local folder and uploading it to the website. As part of that import process, it is analyzing the images. So one of the first things we can do is optionally maintain that information that's been added by Vernon Browser. If I look in the browse data section, I could browse by the image labels. We use a product called Google Cloud Vision to look at the image and then find things that it can detect as subjects within that photo. And so this page has shown me all of the different labels which Google Cloud Vision has added based on the public images. We can choose to disable any particular terms, both globally across the website and on an individual record. So let's look at an example. I could click on Office Ruler and see what images relate to that. And it's in fact, most of our natural science collection uh, images have got a ruler in there for scale. It may be, however, that that's not useful as a tag to browse the website. We don't necessarily need to know that there's a ruler present in that photo. And so if I want to remove that tag, I just need to view a single record that has that. So that's in the image label section of that particular record. And these are the different things it's found. So ruler is one of the terms and office ruler is a secondary term. So on any of those terms, I can choose to either delete it from this one record, or if I decide that that particular term's irrelevant for our own collection, I can choose to delete it from all records. The verify option isn't used often, but it's just a way of confirming that that label is accurate. And it means that if you ever get Google to reanalyze the images, it would always keep that label, even if in the future it's not so sure about it. The other thing that the system was adding was colors. So if we look at the colors of that record, these are the colors that it's identified. And so one of the colors it's found is the tan color, which is just the background paper that the specimen's on. We might decide that that's not actually relevant, so I can just delete that color. And optionally, I can add colors which are present, but weren't large enough to be detected. So this particular bird has an olive green um, tuft under its chin, and I could choose to add that as another color manually.
And I can say, well, just a small portion of the image uh, represents that color. And then it becomes available as one of the swatches that's on that particular record. So you wouldn't often maintain things at this level, but you may have some iconic objects where there's a small amount of the image that has a particular color or where there's a tag that's not appropriate. And this is where you can come in to change those things. The next thing that we can alter is the appearance of the website. And so this is often configured when the website's first set up before the public ever have access to it, and then it might stay the same um, from then on. So we chose a number of different fields to be available uh, on the public website. It's here that we can see if there's different broad collection groups that were defined in that published collections field. So in my case, this is where I've got natural sciences and human history. If I go into that page, it'll list all of the fields and we can optionally disable some fields just for particular collections. So we might decide that the maker field is never used for natural sciences and I could untick that option. We might also choose to fine tune the labels that appear next to those fields on the public site because the labels that you have internally in Vernon may not be the clearest for the public users. And so we can change those labels on the far right. There are other finer controls that we can make in terms of the presentation of each individual field and whether or not they appear as sorting or filtering options. And that's something we normally work together with the client to configure when the site is first uh, implemented in Vernon, Vernon Browser. The next thing that we can maintain are the comments. So Vernon Browser does support public commenting. Uh, only a portion of our clients choose to, to use that, but where it is used, the latest version of the browser supports moderation of those comments. So there's automatic checking for spam using, again, some Google tools, but also you can now optionally say that all comments are moderated. If they are moderated, there's a tab for the ones that are currently on hold and for each of those, you can decide whether you're going to approve or reject the comment uh, or completely delete it from the website. And so there's a test comment that I added earlier in the week and I could decide, well, that's, that comment is actually um, useful on the public site, I will approve it now. When comments are added, uh, staff at your end will automatically get a notification that there's a comment and you can then log in and choose to moderate it at that time. Uh, and you nominate which email address those notifications are sent to. The last major thing that we can do within the admin section is create those curated highlight sets. So this is where you can manually pick records, group them together, order them, and then add them as a set that the public has access to. And so that's done using all of the browse options that are available uh, in the admin interface. So if I go into browse data, I could do a simple search for instance. So I might search for um, everything that's got the word uh, cocktail in it. And so I've got two different glass cocktail shakers. I may decide that I want to create a highlight set for decorative arts within our collection. To do that, I can start saving the things that I'm interested in into a list. The system will show us the most recent list we've been working on, and we can either change that to a different list or start creating a brand new list. And that's what I'll do in this case. So I'll create a new list, which I'll call Decorative Arts. Everything I'm doing at this point is private. So the, the public users can't yet see the, the list that you're building up. And you might work through that with a number of different people over days or weeks, handpicking those items. 
So I could choose other browsing options to pick more of the records. So for example, if I just search for everything in the collection, we get the same filtering options on the left as the public users have. So I might decide, well, all of the vases are decorative arts. I'm going to add all of those in. And so if I want to add those into a list, I can either add them one, or one at a time, or I can use the option at the top of the page to add all of the ones. So let's add all of those in. And then if I go back to the cocktail list, we can see that at the moment they're not in the list. So I can manually on those ones as well, choose to add them. Lastly, I might do an advanced search. So I might search for anything where um, perhaps the description field includes a mention of glass. And so there's a number of other records there, uh, which I haven't picked up and I could manually pick a few of those. So on the left hand side, you can see that all of the options that the public visitors have access to, the admin users can also use those to help them find objects when they're grouping these highlight sets. So the image la labels could be used if you wanted to identify uh, all of the records that had a particular shape or um, all of the cases where there was a portrait with facial hair, they would be the kind of tags which Google would be picking up and adding to the collection. Uh, and they may not exist in the original collections data back in Vernon CMS. We could also browse by colors. So if you wanted to do a highlight set where there were particularly vivid colors or one specific color was represented, that would be a way that you could do that. At this point, I've made all of the records that I want into a single saved list. So the last step I've got is to publish that as a highlight set. And so that's again done through the public appearance section of the admin website. So there's a highlights menu option, and that will show me all of the highlight set uh, which currently exist. I can maintain those existing ones, editing the descriptions or the images or changing the list that they link to. Or in this case, I can create a brand new highlight set. And so I'm going to create a highlight set, which I'm calling decorative arts. Uh, we can also control what the public website address for that page is. So that's just some human readable text that will appear in the address bar. So I could just say decorative arts. I could record a description and that appears on the results page for these. I can manually pick an image for these records. So I've got an image of one of those objects, but it might be a, a portrait shot of uh, the gallery where they're housed, or it might be a cropped image that you've carefully made to represent that particular object. And then lastly, we want to connect it to a saved list. So it knows which list I'm working on, and that's one of the options that I can choose. So I'm going to click on Decorative Arts, and I'll save that list. The system then in the background goes through all of the detail pages for the objects in that list, and it updates those pages so that it shows that it's within that particular highlight set. So as well as seeing the highlight sets on the home page of the public site, we can also see those highlights connected down at the individual object level. So if I go back to our public website and go to the home page, we've now got that as another category. Uh, in the admin section, we can also reorder those. So if you decided that particular highlight should be first in the list, you can change that in the admin section. And then clicking on that category will bring up all of the records that I'd added into there.
So that's some examples uh, of creating highlight sets and how we can modify some of the information that we've uploaded to Vernon Browser and change how it's presented. The last thing I wanted to show in the admin section is the option to delete a record. So you could, for instance, receive a takedown notice for a particular object. Uh, maybe the, the copyright's in dispute or there's some information that's incorrect and you really want to take it off immediately. You just need to have the Vernon ID for that particular object record. And so if you found the object ID and did find object, it'll just ask you for confirmation that that record should be removed and then it's immediately gone from the public site. You should, however, later go back to Vernon CMS and update the object record so that it also doesn't mark that it's published. Otherwise, you could accidentally add that record to the website again in the future. The last thing that I wanted to do today was to just look at those templates that we have and different examples of how other clients had modified those to suit their own particular branding and their particular collections. Vernon Browser version six has just been released uh, and we're working with the Ministry of Transport, sorry, the Museum of Transport and Technology to upgrade their browser site to the latest version. So this new site isn't quite live, but they've given us permission to show one of the new features. And that's the inclusion of topic records Topic records are one of the activity files in Vernon, and they allow you to create an overarching article or topic that links to related subjects, places, objects, and can possibly include formatted text. And so these are um, long form articles which MOTAD has written uh, over the last year in preparation for this new website. And all of this data is stored back in Vernon CMS. Um, so I'll just go into a, a couple of quick examples. One of the items that they have within their collection is a jar of anchovy sauce, which was collected from Antarctica from one of the exploration huts. And so this is a topic record back in the Vernon Activities module, and that topic record has a title. It has one or more associated images. And it has a long article describing a, the history of that source and how it came to uh, be within the MOTAC collection, how it was used by the explorers in Antarctica. We can then use the links on the right to find other topics that might be of interest. There's also at the bottom of that article, options to link to other related records. So things like um, related subjects or events. I'll show an example where there's connected objects as well. So the first of those topic records was one about the iron lung machine, which was used for people with polio. And we can see in the topic on the left that we've included formatting within that article. Uh, that formatting is again stored directly back in Vernon. So we've got italics, bold, we've got bullet points, we've got external links. And so that's using an international standard called Markdown. And that just has basic punctuation characters to indicate formatting. So for instance, it uses asterisks around a piece of text to indicate that it should be in bold. And so there's a free website editor to let you format text like you would within Word with a nice toolbar for bold and links and so on. And then you just cut the, the completed text and paste it back into the particular field in Vernon that's being used. So in this case, it's in the topic description field. And this particular topic links to one related object. And so we could go and see the detail page for that object after finding that particular topic as the starting point. And then as I mentioned, you've got the links on the right. So I could find all of the records where 
there was a subject place of New Zealand. And so these are all of the different topics that have some kind of New Zealand collection, connection. So that's the first example I wanted to show. The second is the British Red Cross. They've recently done a project to create audio interviews about iconic objects within their collection. And they've called that project 150 Voices. Those audio recordings they've chosen to upload to the SoundCloud platform. So that's a public platform where you can upload audio recordings and then play them within the SoundCloud audio player. They've recorded the links to each of those audio files back in Vernon through the external file field. And then in the browser, we automatically detect whether there's a SoundCloud file for the current page. And if there is, we display that file with the SoundCloud player. And so that's made it possible to include that uh, audio content directly within Vernon browser. Another recent example is the Tairawhiri website. They've had somebody translate the key pieces of the interface, the menu options, the introductory description, all of the headings on the first page uh, into Māori. And so throughout the interface, we've then included those translations on that top level menu and then throughout um, the home page and broad sections of the browser. So we've got a couple of sites now that have done that. Uh, and that's relatively simple for us to do. Another example is a site where many of the records in the object collection are interconnected. So this is the Fletcher Trust Archive, and many of their things are catalogued at series level. So instead of cataloging each individual item, they might start off first cataloging a summary of a whole group of items that connect together and then when they have time, catalog individual items within each of those series. And so I'll bring up all of the records on their site. And so we can see that 3000 of those records are those broader accession or series level records. And then 87,000 of them are items. I'll just search for the ones that have an image uh, connected to them, they're more likely to be items. And so we can see photos of historic construction projects that that organization has been involved in. Vernon Browser can show you those connections to the related records. So from this item level record, I can include the link back up to a higher level. And so that's the series where all of those photos that are related together for Winston aggregates are recorded. And then vice versa from the series record, I can present a summary of that record and I can also include thumbnail images of all of the related item le level records. And so that's something which many of the sites are using to show those connections within their collection. With Vernon Browser, you also have control over the size of the image that's published. By default, that's 1200 pixels on the longer side, which is about a, a screen size, but that can be overridden to have smaller or larger images, depending on the preferences of the organization. So Hamilton City Libraries have chosen to upload larger images, and that's particularly useful for things like their map collection. So I could pick one of these individual maps. And then if I clicked on the image to get to the zoom level, I'll be able to access that larger image. And so those are high resolution images where people are then able to go into quite detailed maps and still read the content that's in them. Now, the last example I wanted to show today uh, is what we call kiosk mode in the browser. So in version five, we added an option so that on a particular device, you can indicate to the browser that you're running it as a shared kiosk. And when it's in that kiosk mode, it does several useful things for you. 
It hides all the links which go to external sites. So that means you can have that device running somewhere like a public gallery and you don't have to be worried about somebody clicking on um, a link to Wikipedia that's in a collection record and it jumping off to somewhere else on the internet. We can also set where the default home page for the product is. And so Sargent Gallery using the kiosk mode and the mosaic page or bird's eye view is the home page. And so that's presented on a two meter high touch screen and each of these collection images is about an inch square. And it means people can scroll through that collection. Um, so it presents the whole thing on one single page and we can easily click on an individual image to see the detail. And so what that has done is it's enabled access to the entire collection for physical visitors, people that are coming on site where there's only a small amount of the collection that's available. Uh, the last thing that the kiosk mode does is hide functions that don't make sense when it's a shared device. So an example is the sharing links where you can find an item and then share it on your own Facebook page. That doesn't make sense on a shared screen because you're not going to have each individual visitor logging into their own private Facebook account. So the kiosk mode disables those things. And so that's just a generic part of the software and something that, that can then be used to extend access to that online collection. Okay, well we'll wrap up at that point. Thank you very much for thank you very much for your time today.